Thracian descendant of the enslaved laborers at Monticello who helped to build UVA. She's a social entrepreneur, a mental health advocate, and a social justice ad activist. Myra is also a community fellow at the University of Virginia's Equity Center, a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Charlottesville Metropolitan Chapter, and a member of the Historic Resources Committee for Alabama County. She was recently appointed by the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Development Services to the Marcus Alert Stakeholder Group. And she's coordinator of our nursery at Coos. So Myra, thank you so much for being with us this evening and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much for having me. And first, I want to give you a disclaimer. If you hear a little buzz, I actually think it's my computer. I'm at the Equity Center, and every time I'm on a Zoom here, I hear this little buzz. But I'm so glad to have the opportunity to just share with you a little bit about um, my ancestors and my journey to finding out about them, which I actually think is very unique because I started my position at Church of Our Savior in 2018, it was in the spring of 2018, and it was around that same time that I got on the delegation to go to Ghana, and that was the point that I began to learn a lot about my ancestors. But I'll back up for a minute and say that I'm a Charlottesville native, I've grown up here, and I never knew very much about um, my family's history. I'd been to Monticello many times. I remember going on field trips there as a child and never, ever, ever thinking that I had any type of connection there. Same thing with the University of Virginia. Um, my grandmother did tell me before she passed away that um, we had some connection to Monticello, but I really didn't believe her because at that point, the only family that they were talking about that had a connection to Monticello was the Hemmons family. And my family's last name is Hearn, which is spelled H-E-R-N, or at least that's what it was spelled when they were enslaved. But after they became emancipated, they changed the spelling to H-E-A-R-N, and then eventually H-E-A-R-N-S, same family. So I went on a delegation um, to our sister city and it was about 50 people who went on the delegation. One of them was the historian at Monticello. So when she introduced herself and said who she was, I made it a point to try to connect with her, to tell her who I was, because I was interested in finding out more about my family. I knew at that point, based on my grandmother, that they were we were connected, but I didn't know any much more than that. And so, I had a conversation with her, her name's Naya Bates. She was a historian um, at Monticello. And I said, you know, I'm trying to get connected to find out more about my family. I know they were enslaved at Monticello. And she asked me my family's last name. And I said, Hearn, and she says, we've been looking for your family. And I just, I just got chills when I'm thinking I'm 5,000 miles away from home and it's, it's here that I'm making a connection to my family and that, serendipitous moment in Ghana was life-changing for me because when I came back she the first thing she said to me um, she said you know there have been many books written with information in them about your family and she gave me some of the titles and I started going over to Jefferson's library doing some research and learning more things and wow I mean I think before I learned about my family, I always looked at slavery as just some kind of abstract thing. Yes, as an African-American, I know my ancestors was enslaved, but I never knew their names. I never knew their occupations. I never knew what they did. I didn't know anything. And so it made something that seemed like a historical fact suddenly transform into something that was very personal to me. And I began, more and more research. And I have to say, sometimes it was heartbreaking reading about some of the things that my ancestors endured. Um, some people tend to have this idea that if your ancestors were like enslaved at Monticello or Montpelier or some place like that, that they probably had um, a, a better life. And 
Although it seems like a different type of slavery, the way I see it, slavery is slavery. You're not free, you can't leave, and you're con confined to some of the same things that any other slave are. You can be separated um, from your family at any given point. So. I started to learn more and more about my ancestors. One of my first discoveries was that my um, seventh grade grandmother, Isabel, is actually buried at Monticello in the um, slave burial there, as is 12 other um, ancestors. And I actually, I'm gonna try to share my screen and see, here's a, this is a picture of my third, um, um, great and fourth great grandmother here. And let me see if I can get this. Okay. So I want to show you here. Sorry to go so fast. This is a picture from the uh, Monticello slave burial, African American graveyard. And under the name Hearn, you can see the first one is Isabel. That's my grandmother. And a lot of the other ones listed are her children um, and grandchildren. And I, let me stop sharing this for a second. And I will also say one of the first things I learned is that my family, the Hearn family, came to Monticello in 1774, and they were, um, Thomas Jefferson inherited them from his father-in-law, John Wales, and it was 134 slaves that he inherited. Um, and that's when my grandfather, David and Isabel came. And that's also at the same time that the Hemmings family came. So they all came together to Monticello then. Um, Isabel was a domestic um, slave. So she worked in the house in Thomas Jefferson's um, house. And my grandfather was a carpenter, um, David. They had 10 children. Um, James is the one who kind of follows my bloodline. And then there were, uh, he had nine, Nine other siblings, and some of them I'll speak um, very briefly on, but that's one thing I learned um, just about them being buried uh, there. And some of the siblings, Thurston Hearn, um, that's a sibling, that, so that would be my six, sixth great uncle Thurston. He um, had tried to run away several times. And then one time James Madison came to visit Thomas Jefferson and he hopped on his wagon and passed himself off as one of his servants and was never um, seen again. Another um, aunt, Edith Hearn, she married into the Hemmings family. And one thing I think is very interesting is most of the family, most of the time you hear about Monticello, you hear about the Hemmings family, but there were actually eight other great families there. And they all seem somehow to marry into um, other families. But my family married into the Hemmings family and the Gillette family. So Edith Hearn, that's my aunt. She was, a, um, she trained in the White House for seven years under a French chef there um, while Thomas Jefferson was in the White House. When he came from the White House back to Monticello, the last 17 years of his life, she was the head chef there at Monticello with her sister-in-law, Fanny. And when Thomas Jefferson died in 1826, um, her husband, Joe Fawcett, who was a member of the Hemmings family, was one of the only people freed by Thomas Jefferson. So he was free, but she wasn't. And this is one thing that just gives me chills when I think about it. So he was a free man. He stayed in Charlottesville for 10 years to buy the freedom of his wife and all of his children and grandchildren that he possibly could. He worked at, he even hired himself out to the University of Virginia during this time, but that's the love that they had for each other that was at Monticello and still here in the city. I mean, still here after he became free. In 1829, that would have been the second sale that happened in Court Square here in Charlottesville. And there were six of my ancestors that were sold at that auction and a number of them went to the University of Virginia. One of those I learned was Thrimston Hearn, who was um, a stone cutter. And he actually laid the stone foundation um, for the Rotunda stairs. And so I'm gonna share my screen again and what you're going to see is, 
Hold on. One second. I can't get back to that. Okay. I'm not able to get back to the screen. I'll try again in a second. But if you ever visited the uh, Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, his name is actually not only engraved in there, but it's engraved that he actually, what he did, that he laid the stone foundation for the rotunda. And so it has been like, I don't know, very fascinating learning about my ancestors and what their contributions are. But it's also been heartbreaking because I, I recently read a book um, that was published on um, the enslaved laborers at UVA and the students and how they were treated. And I have to say, I, I cried quite a couple times just reading the book and looking at the conditions that they were subjected to on a regular basis. It seemed at the University of Virginia that um, although the university itself only owned a few slaves, most of the professors there had, uh, had slaves who did the work of the university. So it was a very confusing hierarchy because the students weren't allowed to come with their own slaves to the university, but they were very much upset about that. And so they disciplined the slaves as if they were their own and bossed them around as if they were own. And so it was just, I don't know, if you go to the memorial, you can read some of the incidents um, that happened. And some of them talk about everything from a child, a girl as young as 11 years old being attacked, sexually assaulted, all by the students. It's just, it's really hard um, to absorb because even though they don't list the names of the, the individual slaves sometimes that that happened to, just the culture of the university at that time, there's no way anyone could convince me that all of my ancestors were uh, escaped having to endure um, that level of treatment. And so I also learned about Davy Hearn. Um, Davy and his wife Fanny are two who were sold to the university, but for some reason, um, the universe, well, it's actually odd because their names are all over the university documents, but they didn't have their names on the wall. So for the last year and a half, I've been advocating consistently to get those names added to the wall. And they were added, um, I think two weeks ago, they were added um, to the wall. And I was very happy about that because to me, it's more than just having a name on the wall. It's bringing dignity back to something that was inhumane. It's um, given a full and transparent account of the past. It's it's everything to me, just, just not having their names up there because they weren't, they didn't have that dignity when they were alive. And so when you think about it, they made their mark on history at UVA, Thrimston by laying the stone foundation and helping to build that university. And then all these years later, it's like 193 years later, I make my mark, they're descended by making sure their names are on that wall. So that felt good to me, you know, and I also, sometimes I, wonder, sometimes I sit and think about the fact if they ever thought when they were enslaved, if they ever thought about the generation of their family that wouldn't be enslaved. Um, and when you think about it, although that was 190 plus years ago, my mom was born during segregation. So she was not born with full rights herself. She couldn't drink out of certain water fountains and you know go certain places. So when you think about it, from the time that they were enslaved at UVA and at Monticello, I represent the first generation of my family that was actually born with full rights, not under segregation since then. And so when I, when I think about that, I feel uh, kind of heavy, but I also feel like I have a calling and, you know, I've always considered myself an advocate, but now I feel even stronger because my Thrimston, my uncle helped to lay the foundation and build the university. And now I'm there as an equity fellow helping me. And my project focuses on black mental health. So I'm helping the very people who were treated the worst 
when they were helping to build the university. And it's something about that parallel that, that kind of hits me in a very deep way and it moves me and it pushes me to be the best that I can be. Um, I feel like I almost lost or didn't know the history of my family. It was there all along, but I just happened to be um, the member of my family who, who discovered that. And I think it has helped me to, well, actually it's shaped my perspective on a lot of things. Um, and even in learning about my ancestors, I had to learn a lot more about Thomas Jefferson because they are, are so connected. And um, another interesting fact is Isabel, and that would again be my grandmother who uh, is buried at Monticello. She was actually the person who Thomas Jefferson requested to, uh, to trans, to go with, accompany his daughter um, when she was overseas. But Isabel was very sick at the time from having to give childbirth. So the person that they sent in her place was Sally Hemmings. And you kind of know how the story goes after that. But I also, um, you know, it really pained me a lot as I was realizing that um, just, just how families are married, couples are married, but you're not really married because you can be separate because marriage was not illegal amongst, um, amongst the enslaved and you could be separated at any moment. My grandfather worked his whole life. He worked for 34 years at, uh, this would be my seventh great grandfather, David, at Monticello. He had all his kids, he had all his grandkids. And in the end, in 1827, it was 34 of them that were put on the auction block at the first um, sale. So it's very hard sometimes for me to conceptualize a lot of what I'm reading just because that's not a part of my life today. And um, just understanding how could these people go through that. But when you think about it, they knew slavery, my ancestors knew slavery so that I could know freedom. And it wasn't a choice that they made, but their mere survival of that, it, it, it birthed my existence today. And so I'm always, 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 when I think about it, I, I have gratitude and I have just, just, just so much, um, so much respect for what they went through, even though no one should have to go through that, even though no one should, no human being should be listed in a farm book beside livestock and other things and just treated as property and as something to be owned and, and not something, um, not, not a human being. So it's been a journey and a long one just trying to, um, as, as I continue to discover things, because every day is a new discovery. I'm personally convinced there were more of my ancestors um, that were connected to UVA. So I'm continuing to do research. And, you know, sometimes I just have to take a break because it seems like it's too much. Um, the things that I'm discovering and, um, you know, the heartache, because, you know, Thomas Jefferson himself, they will say, and they maintain, and I, I believe it's true, he never himself, you know, ordered a slave. He never missed treated a slave, but he had overseers who did that, and he did not really um, uh, turn, a, turn an eye to that, and then sometimes, you know, he ordered that, and so I think part of it for me is before understanding the connection of my ancestors, like, oh, you know, he's one of our founding fathers, he did this, he did that, but I'm learning a lot of other things that he did. And to be honest, it's very, very, very confusing. And I don't know how I feel about it. Because on one hand, you take my fifth great grandfather, James, and he went through great lengths to purchase his wife from another, you know, uh, plantation after my grandfather was pleading and pleading for him to do so. So he was committed to bring in this family together, but then he would turn around and take another one of my family members and give it as a gift to his son or, or grandchild. So I'm still like trying to um, 
wrap myself around how I feel about a lot of things and even Jefferson himself. And all I can say is it's, it's complicated and it, it doesn't um, it doesn't very much make sense to me. Um, really, yeah, that's all I can say. Because on one hand, he had all these slaves, you know, that he held on at, at Monticello. But then on the other hand, he's representing a slave who wants his freedom. So it seems like it, it's just such a, and, you know, they have the um, exhibition called A Paradox of Liberty of Thomas Jefferson. And that was actually, um, I saw that when that was in Richmond, but it really gives a true account of somebody who just, to me, just seemed very conflicted on both sides. Now, in no way, um, do I think that slavery in and of itself was right? And even some people during that time did not own slaves, you know? One of the things I found very interested is, you know, President Adams didn't, and that's kind of why him and Thomas Jefferson were at odds a lot. And so I don't know how much time, I, how much time do I have left or have I already gone over my time? Well, we want to leave some time for uh, some questions and comments, but you know, another five or 10 minutes would be fine. Okay, I'll, I'll just say um, a few more words um, and then see if there um, are any questions. Um, so I gave you pretty much, oh, and another fascinating thing about Edith, and this would be, you know, my sixth grade aunt, the one who was the chef. So I don't know if you uh, ever went to, um, um, Keswick, Keswick Country Club had a restaurant there called Fawcett's. It was named after her. And there was actually a picture of her in there, um, in the restaurant. And so Edith and Joe, after the, he was able to free her and a number of his kids, they actually went to Cincinnati and they became um, conductors from, for the Underground Railroad. So I think it's very fascinating that, you know, they were enslaved for so many years. And then when they got their own, when they were able to get their own freedom and move they you know spent the rest of their living days helping other um, slaves who were coming um, up north to do the same thing and so that was something fascinating and there's actually a book written and I think it's called the president's first cabinet and it looks at every single chef for every president from George Washington I think all the way up to President Obama which is when the book was published and um, Edith is in that in that book, and there's been so many things um, written about her, and so that's been very, very, very um, fascinating to learn. And also, just you know, if you go to Monticello and you visit, they have the kitchen there. I'm gonna try. Let me see if I can share my screen one more time. I've lost the document, is what I actually did. So let me. Hmm. I'm not seeing it, but how about this? This is an article, um, this was actually published by Monticello and it says connections between Monticello's enslaved community and UVA. And so they're talking about how they're connected. And if you, there's a, a memorial to enslaved laborers there. And then if you go down a little bit, the first ones they're talking about are the Hearns. And so um, I told you about Thrimston and um, laying the stonework for the steps of the rotunda. And then there was um, David and um, Fanny and um, their uh, son, Bonnie Castle, who, when you think about it, um, and that's another discovery, they kept saying this child, Bonnie Castle, came to UVA. This child was sold with Fanny. And so as I was doing the research to try to figure out, well, how old was this child that, uh, that came with his mom to the University of Virginia? And he was barely one years old when he was put on the auction block down in Court Square. So when I walk in these spaces now, whether it's Court Square, the University of Virginia, or even Monticello, there's a, there's a different level of weight and, and depth to, to how I feel knowing that, that, that I have a greater connection to some of those spaces. And I feel like my job now is, is, has become, I feel I'm called to just continue to tell the stories of my ancestors, continue to learn up as much about them as possible, and continue to fight 
to advocate, to try to make this system more equitable for everyone because there were so many things that they never, that they didn't have, so many things um, that are afforded to us, to me today. And even though I feel like we still have a long ways to go by way of equality and diversity and, and reconciliation and all of those things, you know, there's certainly, when I look back at, at, at their experience having been here and just what, what my experience is and all the generations in between, I have to stay hopeful and I have to stay at a place that we will we will continue, continue, continue um, moving forward. So really that's all I have to say, but I'm happy to um, entertain any questions that anyone has. Are there any?